to see any report from Florida on beans, you know. Probably you may see something in the field like this, but uh, you know, if you uh, say, say it again, you know, probably you need to send to the clinic for uh, identification, you know. And another one is tomato uh, chlorotic spot virus. Uh, you know, we, we first reported this disease, I think back to probably two, three years ago from a uh, greenhouse uh, uh, snappy plants uh, in Homestead. And uh, you see that there are uh, the rooms on the snappy leaves. So basically uh, that's the first report we reported uh, on bees, you know. Uh, Dr. Zhang, can you uh, finish up quickly? Oh, okay. Uh, just a couple of slides I will be done. Sorry. Yeah, that's the, uh, uh, the, the uh, TCSV, you know, on tomatoes, you know, cause the problem on leaves, you know, you may stem and the fruits. And uh, also at least uh, some references you can check, you know, the EDS publication. And also another one is the uh, vegetable production handbook for Florida, you know, every year we update and you will find a lot of information on disease varieties and the control, you know, okay. Okay, that's uh, uh, my contact information. If you have uh, any questions, you can send me email or call me. Okay, so I'm sorry, Craig, you know, I used uh, a little more time. <laughs> sorry, thank you, Dr. Zhang. Um, if hey. anyone has questions, let's go ahead and just put those in the chat. Um, and Dr. Zhang can try to answer them there. Um, if there's any that need more explanation um, at the very end of um, our um, workshop today, then we'll we'll have some time to to answer them all. Okay, okay, thank you. I stop sharing. All right. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so next up is Dr. Richard Reed, um, and Dr. Reed will be talking about current status of sweet corn foliar diseases in South Florida and their management. Dr. Ray, can you go ahead and share your screen? Okay. You got that? Is there everybody got have that? We can't see it now. You can't see it? No. Um, can you see it now? No, you hit, did you hit share screen at the bottom, the green? Let me, let me uh, go back. Go back to Zoom and then hit the green button at the bottom that says share screen. Okay. And then choose the one that you want. No? How's that? Still don't see anything. Uh, yeah, it's, come in. It's not showing, so hold this time. Hold on one second. And Thanks, Ann. It's me to go back from your Zoom. You're doing it from. All right, so we're sharing. Okay. So is it working now, Craig? Yep. Okay. And. Uh, yeah, we need to see the US presentation. Yeah, up, up here. Yeah, start it. There we go. Yeah, okay. Now, we, now you've got it. Great. Looks good. Yep. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, yeah, my name is uh, Dr. Richard Raid. I'm a plant pathologist here at the Everglades uh, Research and Education Center. And I'll be talking a little bit about uh, a few diseases on, on uh, sweet corn, uh, primarily foliar diseases. And uh, these are gonna be primarily uh, foliar blights and rust. Um, we're really lucky uh, that we only really have a, a couple of uh, important diseases on sweet corn, uh, although there's dozens of diseases on, on corn and uh, in the state, uh, but uh, these are the ones that are most important uh, that we see most commonly. And uh, the first of these is uh, common rust and uh, southern rust. Uh, those are two rust diseases that we see on corn. Uh, there's another tropical rust, but we very rarely ever see that on corn uh, here in Florida. That's more of a, a Caribbean uh, disease. We also see several uh, different leaf blights and leaf spots on corn in, in uh, South Florida, uh, primarily southern corn leaf blight, uh, northern corn leaf blight, 
And then there's what we call northern corn leaf spot, uh, much less prevalent than the, the northern and southern corn leaf blades, but uh, still it does show up uh, routinely every year. In terms of uh, uh, common rust, uh, this is caused by a fungus, uh, Puccinia sorgi. Uh, we really consider this, uh, this rust to be a cool temperature disease. Uh, it's favored by temperatures of uh, 16 to 25 degrees uh, Celsius. And we typically uh, see this most commonly in the spring season. Very rarely do we see it in our fall season. Uh, typically in South Florida, we have what we call the, the fall season, which is uh, started planted in um, even late August, uh, September, uh, and is harvested before the, the New Year's. And then we have our uh, our spring season, which is planted usually in uh, December, uh, January, February, and harvested in the spring. And so this is a, a definitely a springtime disease because it, it's a cool temperature disease. Uh, it's most aggressive on newly expand, expanding uh, tissues. Uh, so once those tissues have fully expanded, those leaves have fully expanded very seldom do you get uh, new uh, infections. It, it really it likes to attack that newly expanding uh, tissue. Uh, varietal resistance is available and it's very common for common rust. A lot of the varieties will have an R after them. And typically uh, this R signifies resistance uh, to common rust. Southern corn leaf blight is uh, caused by another Puccinia species, but Puccinia polysora. Uh, it's considered to be a warm temp to hot temperature disease. It loves uh, temperatures uh, much higher than those of common rust, uh, favored by temperatures of 23 to 30 degrees, uh, 3 degrees Celsius. Now this one is most commonly observed in the late fall uh, because it does take some time to build up. Uh, typically the inoculum source for this is, is uh, the Caribbean or Mexico. It blows in in a spore cloud. And so a lot of times we don't see it until late fall or because of the cooler months in the winter time, it doesn't really build up again until late spring. So, so it's a, a fall disease or a, a late spring disease. Uh, this one can be aggressive on both newly and, and expanded tissue. Okay, so a lot of times this particular rust can build up to much higher levels uh, than common rust. And you can see the, the plethora of, of uh, sporulation, spore uh, pustules on the leaves. Oftentimes, uh, leaves will be just completely covered with uh, uh, southern rust uh, um, pustules uh, on susceptible uh, uh, varieties. There is some varietal resistance, but it is not as available as that for common rust. And so, um, this, this disease uh, on a lot of our species, it can be uh, a pretty significant problem if allowed to build up. Uh, southern corn leaf blight is uh, uh, it's much different than the rust. It's caused by uh, Bipolaris matus. Um, this is considered to be a warm or hot temperature disease. Uh, it's favored by uh, temperatures similar to those of, of the uh, southern rust. Uh, 20 to 32 degrees C. It's most commonly seen in our uh, fall seasons and then again in the late spring season because of that being favored by the higher temperatures. Um, it can be aggressive on both newly expanded tissue and also uh, older leaf tissue. So this one uh, can attack the corn at any leaf stage, uh, typically moves from the bottom of the plant up uh, to the top of the plant and it will keep infecting uh, until that plant is harvested. So you can have uh, uh, corn plants that are totally infected from top to bottom with uh, southern corn leaf blight. This particular leaf blight has really been uh, more of a problem than northern corn leaf blight, which I'll talk about um, in recent years. Uh, I think we're seeing warmer temperatures. And, and so because this is favored by those warmer temperatures, it's becoming more and more of a problem uh, than our other diseases. Northern corn leaf blight uh, is uh, caused by uh, the fungus Xerohylum tersicum. Uh, we consider this to be a cool to moderate temperature disease. Um, it's favored by temperatures of 18 to 27 degrees C. Now this one we typically see most common during our spring uh, sweet corn season. 
And so it takes those uh, uh, cooler months, uh, starts building up. And uh, then by the end of the spring, um, it has built up. And typically when we start to see the high temperatures at the end of our spring season, it's starting to die back because of those higher temperatures. But it's uh, probably our most important disease in our spring uh, sweet corn crop. Uh, there is some very good varietal resistance uh, to uh, northern corn leaf blight. And uh, over the, the last uh, few years, we've seen some, some really good resistance to this uh, particular blight. And uh, it's much less of a problem than it used to be. Another disease I'll talk about is uh, northern corn leaf spot. And uh, all of these leaf blights are, are somewhat related. They, they were all belonging to what we used to term the helminthosporium diseases or fungi. Uh, this one is caused by Biopolaris zeicola also called uh, Helminthosporium carbonum. Uh, it's considered to be a cool to moderate temperature disease. Uh, the, the temperatures it's favored by are somewhat right between those of northern corn leaf blight and southern corn leaf blight. And I, I really consider this disease to be kind of a tra transitional disease uh, between our, our fall, our warm fall uh, season and the cool spring season. So we'll oftentimes see this one uh, in uh, uh, December and January uh, during those uh, cooler months. Um, it typically never builds up to the levels that northern corn leaf blight and southern corn leaf blight do, but it's characterized by these um, elongated kind of target shaped uh, lesions, um, whereas the northern corn leaf blight characterized by long elliptical lesions and the southern corn leaf blight uh, characterized by uh, small, much smaller rectangular type of lesions. And uh, so the uh, uh, Bipolaris zeichla, um, there are a number of uh, hybrids that we've seen over uh, the years that do seem more susceptible to this particular disease, but very rarely do I ever see this disease build up to what I would consider to be economic levels. Uh, once the, the corn really gets uh, above uh, maybe knee high or so, uh, this disease kind of really tapers off. It, it doesn't progress up into the upper canopy like northern and southern corn leaf blights uh, do. Now we have a, a, a number of uh, groups of fungicides that are, are uh, commonly used on, on uh, sweet corn. And uh, I've listed those here. We have what we call the broad spectrum protectants. Uh, these were the old standbys uh, that uh, have been around for decades, uh, chlorothalonil, maneb, uh, sulfurs. Uh, those uh, were, when I first came to the glades, those were really the only uh, uh, fungicides that we had of any significance on, on corn. However, over the years, we've got a lot of new chemistry. And the first of the new, new chemistries that came along were the triazoles. These are also referred to as the, the demethylation inhibitors, uh, the DMIs. Uh, this is the FRAC class uh, threes. Uh, and then we came out with the uh, carboxamides, the SDHIs. These are really probably the, the newest group of fungicides uh, that we have now labeled on corn. And uh, they're, they're um, finding a place uh, among our, our fungicidal tools. Um, after the DMIs or the triazoles came along, we had the strobilorins that came out. These are the uh, quinone inhibitors, outside quinone inhibitors. And uh, these were uh, a real good addition to our fungicide tools uh, when they first came out. And, uh, and, and they're now routinely uh, used in most of the programs. Um, I've also listed potassium phosphate here. Uh, oftentimes it's listed more as a nutrient, uh, but it does uh, have some uh, capacity, almost like a, a systemic acquired resistance uh, inducer. Uh, to lower uh, disease susceptibility. And so I, I've uh, added that in here. Now, in terms of the broad spectrum protectants, uh, there's, there's really three classes. So we have the sulfur. Um, I typically don't recommend using sulfur on corn. However, if you do have a mite problem, uh, sulfur can, can be a, a good uh, mite suppressive uh, tool. And uh, it's a, uh, uh, not a very good fungicide, but um, so I don't recommend it. it's routine use. However, for, for organic uh, sweet corn growers, 
it's it's really probably one of the only fungicides I have uh, that are really effective. Uh, so, but uh, avoid using during hot weather and and following oils. It has a short PHI of one day. Mancozeb, uh, of all the broad spectrum protectants, it's probably our standby. And uh, this has been around uh, for for decades, and and it's very good against uh, all of the the blights and the rust. However, you have to have good protective coverage. Okay, so it's a it's a just a protectant, and uh, it may also offer a little bit of uh, manganese nutrition uh, since it's got manganese in it. Uh, it's got a seven day PHI. Um, this is really the go-to broad spectrum protectant that I you would use in my uh, sweet corn program, uh, alternating with some of the other uh, more systemic uh, and uh, translaminar products that I'll talk about. Uh, chlorothalonil, another broad spectrum protectant. Uh, it's again, really active against both rust and leaf blights. Uh, the, the efficacy is very similar to that of Mancozeb. Uh, however, I, I think Mancozeb offers a little bit more uh, efficacy on, on corn, uh, maybe not on some other crops, but, um, and then you've got the addition of the manganese with the Mancozeb too. So, so my preference is usually to go with uh, Mancozeb as my broad spectrum protectant on corn. Uh, in terms of the, the triazoles, uh, we've uh, had some old, old uh, standbys. Uh, Propiconazole was really the, the uh, uh, first that, that came uh, out and uh, joined us on corn. And then we've had some others uh, come along in more recent years. Um, mo many of these you're, you're um, already familiar with, but for the most part, uh, they're efficacious. Uh, th these are probably the most efficacious group against the foliar blights. They do have rust activity, but they're, they're really tops against the foliar blights. Um, one new addition this year uh, is the uh, Mefen uh, trifluconazole. Uh, this has come out and it's a, a part of a, uh, some of the uh, uh, combination products that I'll talk about. Uh, this triazole in particular is extremely uh, efficacious against northern corn leaf blight. It's got ex uh, very good uh, residual control. And uh, it, it really is, has been a standout in, in some of our more recent uh, fungicide trials, uh, especially when we're comparing triazole chemistry. So, and then uh, flutriafol is a, a newer addition, and we're starting to see this now uh, being marketed actually as a, uh, as a plant uh, at uh, a fungicide that can be applied in the furrow and maybe giving um, good early season and I don't know if I would say uh, full season control, but um, uh, we, we have to have a little bit more experience with it, but uh, this is a new addition to this uh, group. The strobilorins, uh, these have really become uh, the, the go-to uh, class, the group uh, 11 class on, on sweet corn. Uh, um, most of these have been um, out for uh, many uh, years. Thus far, I have not seen what I would term resistance to any of the uh, uh, strobilurins or the triazoles on corn, but it's something that we always need to be aware of and, and conscious of. Uh, these are, are really the most efficacious group against common and southern rust. They also have uh, very good blight activity, but in terms of rust, your strobilurins are your, your strongest chemistries. Uh, they have uh, typically a pretty short uh, uh, pre-harvest interval of about seven days. Uh, these can vary, uh, but um, about seven days. Um, they've got uh, protective and translaminar and curative properties, and uh, they're typically uh, uh, used in, in most of our sweet corn management uh, program, disease programs now. And then the last group that's uh, come on board in sweet corn really has been the, the uh, FRAC uh, group seven. These are the carboxamides. And uh, um, some of these, uh, I've found of, of the different uh, classes that we have of the class threes, the class sevens and the class 11s, these are the ones that vary the most among, uh, within the class. So some of these are really good uh, against blights, uh, other ones uh, not so good. But others are, are very good against rust. For instance, uh, the uh, benzo uh, vinda flipper is uh, very good against rust, not so much against the blights. Uh, but um, 
some of the others uh, have much better blight uh, than rust uh, um, activity. Uh, and so uh, these, are, these are good additions, uh, but most of the time uh, they are in combination with some of our other chemistries, the class threes and the class 11s. And uh, so those are the next group I'll talk about, premixtures. And uh, uh, most of the, the uh, ag chemistry uh, uh, companies are, are, are starting to really uh, um, put out premixtures in terms of uh, uh, corn, sweet corn, um, fungicide uh, management. And uh, most of these are very efficacious against both rust and, and foliar blights. Um, you know, they're, they're uh, all pretty much really strong uh, uh, chemistries. Uh, they typically have maybe a little bit longer pre-harvest pre interval of seven to 14 days, depending on what the components are, uh, but they have protectant, translaminar, and curative properties. Um, and many of these offer much longer residual activity than the solo compounds of, of say, just the triazoles or maybe just the uh, um, strobilurins. So, so uh, some of these uh, uh, premixtures I've, I've found have excellent uh, uh, residual activity uh, going maybe sometimes uh, up to several weeks uh, long. And uh, you want to make sure that uh, you, you read all your labels so that you have an idea of uh, there are some plant back restrictions and uh, uh, reentry restrictions. Um, you know, they get really complicated sometimes. But uh, here you can see the, the long list now that we have of, of uh, premixtures. Uh, and these are all available on corn. And you can see that they are primarily uh, mixtures of, of those classes that I talked about, the threes the sevens and the elevens. So you've got your triazoles, your carboxamides and your strobilurins. Uh, there's only a couple of that are even premixed with uh, maybe your, your more broad spectrum uh, um, protectants. And, uh, but uh, some of these uh, now are, are combining up to three uh, compounds in them. And uh, some of these will give you almost season long control. For instance, this past year I, I've been trialing uh, this uh, product, Revitec, uh, I've gotten on susceptible uh, varieties of sweet corn almost uh, full season uh, control with, with uh, two applications. And so really uh, just a couple of applications of these premixtures, uh, maybe interspace with your Mancozeb uh, can give you excellent control of uh, your uh, fungal blights and your rust. So in terms of uh, management strategies, uh, really one of the things I wanna stress is, I, I, I always make a, a statement to growers, start clean to stay clean, okay? So you really wanna start off uh, planting in, fi in, in fields that are free of corn debris. That corn debris is one of the reasons that we, we the absence of corn debris is one of the reasons we don't have gray leaf spot uh, here in Florida. All over the corn belt, gray leaf spot is a major problem because they have no till, they've got debris there. That serves as a source of inoculum. If you're planting into clean, uh, de debris-free fields, uh, you're way ahead of the game in terms of a lot of these uh, uh, blights. Um, the uh, rust diseases, those are very easily uh, windblown, so those can kind of uh, fl fly in, but um, they don't rely so much on corn debris as your uh, fungal blights, uh, but um, uh, starting clean is, is one way to stay clean. Be, and uh, this is something that um, uh, Schwann touched upon, is being aware of your surroundings. If you know that there, your uh, neighbors got corn in the ground um, and you, you can see that disease on there, you, you can expect that it's going to uh, blow into your field. So all of these uh, fungal uh, diseases that I've talked about, especially the rust, are, are easily uh, wind disseminated. And so they can be uh, spread for, for uh, uh, hundreds of yards, miles even uh, for the rust. Uh, but um, even your, your blights, uh, southern corn leaf blight, northern corn leaf blight can, can spread some distance. So if, if uh, you're familiar with your, your uh, surroundings, you, you can kind of know what to expect. Wherever possible, use available host plant resistance. We now have really good resistance uh, to common rust and also to northern corn leaf blight, uh, less so for southern rust and, and southern corn leaf blight. 
But if you've got resistance to use and you've got good varieties that, that are, you know, acceptable for your market, use that host plant resistance as much as possible. You can really reduce the amount of spraying that you're going to have to do. Um, scout early and thoroughly and uh, know what's going on in your fields. Um, and this, this means really uh, scouting those fields uh, as soon as that crop uh, comes up. I typically would recommend uh, using your, your uh, man, Mancozeb uh, early on in your, your growth season. Um, and uh, that's a good uh, protectant. Uh, you can get good coverage when the th foliage isn't thick. And so you can uh, uh, make use of, of that cheaper compound early on. And then uh, later on, use your more expensive uh, chemistries, your, your triazole, strobilurins, and premixtures. Um, you know, uh, Craig and, and uh, Gene McAbee over the years have done an excellent job with their, their extension newsletters and the pest alerts. You know, pay attention to those. Uh, it, it, uh, oftentimes they, they, they contact us to know what's going on. And, uh, and that way you'll, you'll know uh, what's going on and, and maybe ahead of the game in terms of uh, your, your own crop. Um, in terms of uh, spreader stickers, I typically do recommend a non-ionic uh, spreader sticker uh, with, with most of the fungicides that uh, I've uh, used in my trials. Um, and I, I think this just uh, gives you a better adherence, especially early on. Uh, it, when, you're, when you have that crop uh, and the, the corn is, is about knee high, less than knee high, uh, that those leaves are a little bit more waxy and, and uh, they, they kind of almost repel uh, fungicides. So I, I use a spreader sticker to get better coverage and adherence. Uh, and so um, um, I know a lot of uh, corn is sprayed uh, typically by air, um, but when possible, you know, if you're going through with a ground rig for another purpose or that, and if you can um, uh, time it, you know, a, a good um, uh, application uh, by ground, especially when that, that uh, canopy is filling in uh, and the mature world stage, uh, it, it can really, really do well. And uh, uh, it provides you that good coverage and, uh, and thorough, um, thoroughly th protecting that, that canopy. Um, one thing uh, you want to be a little bit aware of is, is uh, when you're spraying and that, that tassel is starting to show, uh, when you, you're starting to push that tassel, you can get um, uh, a little bit of uh, phytotoxicity from some fungicides and spreader stickers. So uh, at that particular stage, you want to be uh, maybe back off on use of spreader stickers and then know uh, which chemistries might give you a little bit of this uh, phytotoxicity. Uh, it's very uncommon, but like Folicure is a triazole if it's sprayed uh, uh, into that um, a uh, world that's got that uh, tassel showing, uh, you can get some phytotoxicity. So kind of be aware of that. And I, I've noticed uh, in some of their um, labeling that, that a lot of the companies are, are, you know, kind of warning for that. So look for that. Um, be aware of your PHIs, your re-entries in your plant backs. You know, sometimes uh, things don't make sense in terms of uh, re-entries uh, and uh, plant backs. Um, especially with Folicure, it, it was one that, that really presented some problems uh, for us. Uh, so, so read those uh, so that you're up on those before you actually use these chemistries. And then alternate your chemistries. Um, you know, uh, we, we do have, the, uh, we're very fortunate in having a, a good broad spectrum protectant like Mancozeb and also chlorothalonil. Uh, you know, these allow us to, uh, to rotate even the premixture. So, so uh, this is uh, important and uh, it gives us a, a much better program. And then uh, stay ahead of the disease. Don't let it build up and then expect to bring it under control once that disease is raging. You want to stay ahead of the disease. And uh, over the years, uh, uh, even on susceptible varieties, which I use in all of my fungicide trials, um, you know, I am now getting, getting really excellent control uh, with anywhere from uh, two to, to six uh, applications of fungicides. Uh, and so uh, we've really come a long way in terms of reducing the numbers of fungicides uh, that we need to apply. And, uh, and a lot of times I'll look at the, some of the commercial production and, and really there's, there's uh, hardly a lesion to be found. And it's uh, a lot of times uh, due to the excellent uh, scouting 
um, and then the uh, excellent uh, fungicide programs that we have. And uh, um, you know, there's an old saying, but it's it's definitely one worth remembering: an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, before we go and and leave, uh, I'd like to just mention one other disease that we're, we've seen. Um, in recent years, uh, I don't see it as being a big problem on sweet corn, but I want you to keep your eyes open for it and let us know if you do see it. This is tar spot. This disease is now uh, established up in the corn belt where they grow a lot of field corn. Um, and uh, it's, uh, we have seen it uh, here in Florida for four out of the last five years. We first reported it in 2016. It produces these small raised lesions. You can see how these, these lesions are raised on the leaf surface. And it looks like somebody just dipped a paintbrush in, in uh, uh, tar, hot tar, and just kind of whipped it at the plant, uh, splattering it. And sometimes these uh, raised lesions will, will have a, a necrotic spot around them. Uh, when we've seen it, it appears in late spring, primarily on field corn. I've only seen it on, on uh, sweet corn that has been non-sprayed with fungicides. So we think that fungicides do an excellent job in keeping it out of, of sweet corn. Um, but uh, with that, um, I'll, I don't know if we have time for questions, but uh, how are we doing? Great. Thanks, Dr. Ray. Um, we have to move on, but if you have questions, okay. please go ahead and put them in the chat and we can make sure that they get answered for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Julian Buslin, and he'll have two presentations for us today, um, one on aphids and fall armyworms and sweet corn, and one on corn silk fly. Um, thank you, uh, Craig, uh, for the opportunity uh, to, to talk this afternoon. Um, as you said, first, I'll talk a little bit about uh, fall armyworms and, um, and aphids. Let me uh, share... Uh, my uh, presentation. All right, can you um, guys see? Um, that looks good. Okay. All right, well, um, thanks. Uh, before we, we go further, um, I have a few questions um, for you. Uh, don't worry, there are not too many of those, total of, of six. And um, just wanted to engage the audience a, a little bit and have an idea of what you think. And um, this is um, uh, anonymous, but um, here's a question uh, that I have for you uh, before we start. Um, as of right now, this afternoon, um, here's the statement. I intend to use or recommend the use of Transform, that's the Fox floor for um, aphid uh, management in sweet corn. So I'd like to know if um, at this stage you would um, strongly disagree, disagree, would be uncertain, agree, or strongly disagree with this statement. Right now we have five people that have answered. I'll leave a little bit more time. Right. 10 out of 21 participants. All right, I'll, I'll close the, the poll and share that with you. And we'll see if uh, by the end of the, uh, the presentation, this uh, changes. Um, so you can see here that um, actually uh, more than 58% of, of our group today is uncertain, but some people, um, um, know that uh, they would uh, rely on, on transform. So uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, so that was for aphids. We'll go back to aphids, but I will first uh, talk about the fall armyworm. Um, here are the, the larvae here, uh, showing some of uh, the differences in uh, size and, and color. Um, hopefully you don't see that too often in your fields. And um, well, they do feel, uh, feed on world stage corn, uh, but also on, on tassels and ears and cause um, that type of um, damage. Um, sometimes, um, especially in the ears, you can also find a corn earworms, that's a uh, different species. So if you have um, a caterpillar, uh, do not assume it's um, always um, a fall armyworm. I, Often say that actually fall armyworm is 
an in, a major insect pest of corn, but it's not uh, a management problem uh, under uh, current um, uh, production conditions because we have numerous insecticides uh, that are uh, registered with diverse modes of action and uh, they are effective. However, um, methamyl, so typically lanate, uh, remains um, our go-to um, insecticide. Um, but insecticide resistance is um, always a concern and not too far from us in Puerto Rico, for example, um, they have major uh, resistance issues with all the excuse me, all the, the chemistries that we have um, available. So, so far as far as we can tell, um, we do not have resistance issues here uh, in Florida, but I uh, would continue encouraging um, the industry to rotate um, modes of action um, so that we can maintain uh, those, um, those, uh, the effectiveness of those, uh, those uh, chemistries. Um, we have a Lanate, Ryman, Radiant, Quargen, Avant, for example, that are registered and that can be effective. Now, um, this is the last slide on Falami worm. I did not have much. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, major change concerning uh, insecticides for a uh, Falami worm. However, there are a few uh, new products. Uh, there is uh, Elevest, it's an FMC premix of chlorantraniliprol and bifenthrin. So, chlorantraniliprol is the uh, active ingredient uh, that you have in quargen, for example. So in a way, uh, that would be the same approach as Besiege, a uh, Syngenta product that has chlorantraniliprol and lambda sahelothrin. So um, depending on pricing and availability, that's something that could be considered. Um, there is also a new product called uh, Ventacor. And so this one is chlorantraniliprol only. So it's close to cargen, for example, but this is a concentrated uh, formulation, uh, 1.2 to 2.5. Uh, fluid ounces per acre and um, so it can be potentially uh, more convenient but also this particular insecticide is registered for soil uh, application um, at planting. Uh, we're not sure how effective those applications at planting would be especially in muck soils but uh, this is an option that we uh, have with this insecticide. There's also a foligen that's a fall armyworm a virus um, I honestly don't know how available it is on the market right now, but I've heard about it and I've heard uh, that some growers uh, might have had the opportunity to, to look at it. And um, I think that there's a lot of um, research that is ongoing right now for viruses against a uh, fall armyworm. And so um, if you have an opportunity, this is something uh, that would be worth considering at least on, on small acres uh, or something like that. Um, I'll see if I have the opportunity to, uh, to take a look at it um, at the station. So this is what I had uh, for, for army worms. Um, said usually it's not a management issue, although it can be uh, relatively severe if we do not have uh, the, the right insecticides. Um, I would like to spend some time talking about um, aphids. We have uh, typically three species that are causing issues uh, in our industry. Um, corn leaf aphid, bird chariot aphid, and uh, the cotton aphid. And um, the latter, cotton aphid, um, has been uh, the most problematic, especially during the, uh, the, uh, the spring season with uh, high infestations um, and uh, with honeydew and sooty mold really decreasing uh, the, the quality uh, of the crop. And so this is how, well, these infestations were not awful, but still they were not um, they were not good. And so this is how a cotton aphid uh, infestation uh, can look like. You see, um, picture on the right probably uh, has more than 100 aphids on, on, on the plant uh, or on the leaf. Uh, here you see even uh, they can make it to the ear. And so you have those infestations uh, that, uh, that um, can cause problems, especially in late March, uh, getting in, into April. Based on, on reports from growers and, and consultants, it seems that the only insecticide that has provided um, acceptable control is, is Sivanto, uh, primarily at um, high rates. Uh, but this is a relatively um, expensive uh, product. 
And so now we have um, another uh, potential option, uh, this product uh, from Corteva, uh, it's called a transform. Uh, the active ingredient is sulfoxaflor. So um, for those who are familiar with Closer, for example, uh, this is a different formulation of, of the same insecticide. And so it was recently registered for use in sweet corn, has the seven day PHI. So this is something uh, that uh, could be considered. So how does it work? Well, in spring uh, 2018, um, I had the uh, opportunity to look at closer. So we assumed that the efficacy would be the same. I was at a research station. And uh, here on this chart, I'm reporting uh, the total number of aphids on a plant, but counted on topmost leaf, flag leaf, and, and the ear, so that you just have an idea of what, what we're counting. And so we initiated the test when we had, um, we observed about 20 aphids per plant. So just to give you an idea, it was relatively low infestation levels. And so we had one um, application and you can see the results three days after treatment, six days after treatment and 10 days after treatment. Um, unfortunately for this particular evaluation, you can see in the non-treated, the infestations uh, trended down, but at least we had some indication that the three rates of closer worked um, about the same efficacy as a Sivanto at uh, an intermediate rate. So luckily, um, well, here that's uh, some stats for the, the six days after treatment. Um, luckily last year, uh, with uh, Matt Bardin's help, we were able to find a commercial field uh, that had um, an infestation and um, we were able to, to set up uh, another evaluation. And so this one we use transform again at three rates. So here what I'm reporting is slightly different. We're reporting the number of aphids per leaf. So slightly different number but per leaf uh, average over the topmost leaf and the flag leaf. And we looked three, eight and 11 uh, days after treatment. So very different situation from the, the previous year. You can see in the non-treated check, we had uh, infestations that were skyrocketing. Uh, we initiated about uh, a little bit more than two weeks uh, before harvest. But you see that again, the transform did um, very good job, or at least as good as Sivanto, uh, reducing uh, those, uh, those infestations. So transform, we uh, looked at least at the uh, active ingredient um, in two uh, independent tests. And um, so we think this is a viable alternative to uh, Sivanto with um, comparable efficacy. Uh, but what we have to mention is that this is a product uh, that is less expensive. Um, we should uh, gain more experience with aphicides. Uh, that would be useful, work more on timing of the application, number of applications. Um, those results are presented. We did not have any surfactant to try to see if the surfactant uh, changes something. And also uh, there is another product uh, Endigo ZCX, which is a premix from Syngenta that has the neonicotinoid thymethoxam and the parathroid lambda cyhalothrin. Uh, I think it's still not registered yet, but we are uh, waiting on the label uh, anytime soon that that might have at least some uh, suppression on, on the aphids. So we plan to do uh, more um, uh, aphid work. Um, this is what I had for uh, for this, I will ask again the same question as I asked a few minutes ago, but I wanted again to uh, thank Matt Bardin uh, for uh, his help, the, the second, uh, uh, the second uh, AFID test, and uh, also my crew, Donna, Eric, Balwinder, Victoria, and Amir for, for the help. So um, now if we're all curious to see, um, I'm gonna ask the same question. So now, based on um, what I've talked, um, would you intend to use, or at least recommend the use of Transform for um, aphid uh, management in sweet corn? So we have 11 people that answered. I think that was the number we, uh, we had. So I will end the poll. Oh, we have a few more. Give you another second, 14, okay. 
Okay. All right, I'm gonna stop the poll and share the results with you. So actually we um, had less uh, uh, people that are uncertain. What's interesting is we have uh, two people in the group that strongly disagreed. And so um, I would be curious to know why this would be good discussions because I still don't have a very good feel for um, uh, AFID uh, management. We need more work, but uh, it also looks like some people would be willing to, to, consider, uh, to consider transform. And so that's really what I wanted to, to make sure that uh, you guys were, um, were aware that uh, this insecticide now was um, available. I will stop sharing uh, this screen. Um, Craig, do you think we should um, add uh, something before we move on to sale flies? I think you should go for it. All right, so now the, now the real insect pests. Uh, let me change presentation because yet yeah, sale flies are so important that they have their own presentation. It's not the same. Well, that's good because it's not working. <laughs> Wait a second. All right, so now I should be sharing. So can you all see? Looks um, good. All right. So now let's talk a little bit about seal flies. Uh, we have about 35 minutes. We'll, we'll see if we have to, to cut some. Um, uh, to cut some sections. Uh, with Zoom, we cannot always have, it's not always very smooth having people interrupt, but really if you have a burning question, uh, let me know. I think uh, those workshops, they should be as interactive as possible. So please uh, let me know if you have a question or let Craig know. Um, unfortunately, when uh, we produce sweet corn in Southern Florida, uh, we often have CL5 maggots uh, that infest the ears, even when we um, carefully. Um, manage the crop. And um, all those maggots, um, they look alike. However, um, seal flies are actually a complex of uh, several species. And we have uh, primarily three species uh, that are causing issues. And it's uh, helpful to have the uh, ability to, to identify them. And so how can we do that? Well, um, adults actually can be identified. So, for example, um, here is um, a sylphi adult in a sweet corn field at early silking, and you've just seen a few of those um, in the field. Um, what are your thoughts? Um, if you see this one, for example, it's also in a sweet corn field, you've seen a few. Um, what are your thoughts? I'm gonna have a poll now to see uh, what you would think. So I'm gonna launch this poll. And so again, this is that seal fly. And so your thought is that actually the only good seal fly is a dead seal fly. And well, I mean, has some value. Um, it success the stigmatias and uh, you should be concerned. It success the stigmatias and you should be madly concerned. It's Ketopsis macilla and you should be very concerned and it's Ketopsis macilla, and it looks like the copy paste did not work, but this one would be mildly concerned as well. And so, uh, all right, I have, uh, I, we have some people who think that the only good seal fly is a dead seal fly. Uh, I like, that's, that's the spirit. Uh, all right, well, I will. We have 13 people that have uh, participated in, um, in the poll. And so I will end uh, the poll right now. And so you see that um, a large number of people thought that the only good seal fly is a dead seal fly, but um, also, uh, well, actually, the majority of people think that this is success astigmatias. And um, oh, sorry, I forgot to share. Um, and so, well, so the only good seal fly is a, is a dead seal fly, 38%, and 54% uh, of the participants um, think that this is a Uxesta stigmatias and should be very concerned. Well, so let's see. I'm gonna stop sharing. So these are uh, pictures of 
pin insects that show well the differences uh, among the different species uh, with Euxesta stigmatias that has those four uh, bands uh, on the wings. If you can see uh, my arrow, Euxesta eluta also has four bands with that clear spot and Chetopsis mesilla, which only has um, three bands, um, but uh, here you see uh, there is no band. Uh, but in the field, it's more challenging. Uh, obviously, the flies uh, do not stand uh, like this, and you do not always see the bands very well. So here are a few uh, pictures that are more realistic. Um, here on the left, uh, you do have Euxesta stigmatias with the four bands, but if you don't see that fourth band really well, look at this band here in the middle. It tends to be somewhat wide. Uh, if you compare that to Chetopsis mesilla to the right, has three bands, but you see that band in the middle is somewhat narrow and the abdomen here, because of uh, the absence of the fourth band, it's somewhat uh, light colored. So uh, you do not always have to rely on the number of, um, of bands, but really the band patterns uh, are important. Euxesta eluta has this clear spot, so it's relatively easy to, uh, to identify. So here are uh, different pictures of, again, Euxesta stigmatias, Euxesta eluta and um, Euxesta and Chetopsis mesilla. So why is species um, identification important? Well, actually until the late 2000, um, only uh, Euxesta stigmatias was considered a sweet corn pest, but we realized that there were um, different species and they are not uh, interchangeable pests. Um, Euxesta stigmatias is primarily an issue in the southern region of the state, prefers laying eggs um, on, on silks, but also it tends to be tougher to, to manage. Um, so species um, identification um, is important for some uh, management decisions. So again, if we um, revisit um, our uh, seal fly pictures, we'll uh, spend a little bit less time on this, uh, on this one here, but so, Again, you see this in your field, what, what are your thoughts? Do you still think that the only good seal fly is a dead seal fly or that is stigmatias and you should be very concerned, stigmatias mildly concerned, Chetopsis mesilla uh, should be very concerned or Chetopsis mesilla and should be mildly concerned? Well, so far, you are all answering the same answer so this is a good sign all right we still have um some people are really serious about seal flies all right i will end the poll now and i will share not forgetting to share and so yes uh, this is success stigmatias and uh you should be concerned um a good seal fly is a dead seal fly it's it's a safe approach so i have um I cannot say much, uh, much uh, against this. So uh, what does that uh, tell us if you see this picture? And so here that's Chetopsis mesilla. And um, I think that when, when you see that in the field, of course, we have to be very cautious, but we've seen relatively high uh, Chetopsis uh, mesilla in uh, adults, uh, well, adult population levels in the fields with uh, very few maggots. So uh, I think that at least um, on, on the, relative scale of, of concerns, if you primarily see that in the field, you should be less concerned than if it's uh, uh, Euxesta stigmatias. Um, Euxesta eluta um, would be in between. All right, um, we'll shift gears now and talk a little bit about uh, the biology of seal flies and, and the host plants. Um, first, starting with um, a reminder on the life cycle of the seal flies. So the adults, we just talked about them. Uh, they are the free living stage of the insects. Um, the females, they will lay eggs uh, on corn silk, uh, but also actually on other host plants. The eggs don't move. Then you have the maggots that feed on uh, plant tissues. Um, the movement is very limited. And then uh, upon the completion of larval development, the larvae will pupate. And actually that will happen typically uh, in the soil from where uh, the, uh, the adults uh, will, uh, will emerge. But where do uh, the seal flies, um, the, the adults 
uh, where do they go and where do they lay eggs? Actually, we do not have uh, that much information on this. Um, here, this is from a publication uh, from Dax Seal. I was in uh, 1996. And they only looked at Uxista stigmatias, which should be the predominant in the, in the homestead, uh, predominant species in the homestead area. And you see, they looked at many different species. Uh, they dissected the plants to see if they could find larvae. And they also um, observed the plants in their habitats to see if they could see adults. So the bottom line here is you can find adults pretty much everywhere. Um, they can lay eggs and have maggots in also a, a variety uh, of plants. Although if you look at the numbers in sweet corn, uh, it seems that a sweet corn is definitely uh, the preferred host. So that was for homestead. Um, what do we know in um, the EAA? Uh, Gaurav Goyal, he was a Greg Nusli student in uh, the late uh, 2000, uh, graduated in 2010 with his PhD. And um, he conducted some sweet net sampling and direct observations in the EAA. And um, the quantification is relatively weak and it's not really replicated, but still, it showed that actually when looking at snap beans, cabbage, sugarcane, Johnson grass, ragweed, parthenium, common purslane, cattail habitats, that all our three species, the adults, could be collected. But also in some instances, and especially uh, when um, the plants were injured, they could find the three species, uh, the maggots in Johnson grass stems, or um, if it's not Johnson grass, that would be a sorghum almond, um, uh, Columbus grass, but it was reported that Johnson grass. Uh, in rotting uh, bell peppers, they found in Luta and Ketopsis massilla uh, maggots. In cattails, uh, Ketopsis massilla, also in, in pigweed. So you see that um, you can find uh, cell flies everywhere, but not much of a quantification here. That work, I wanted to mention that, was complemented by some uh, laboratory experiments. You see they looked at many different plants and plant parts in the lab. And what they did, they put those plant parts in a cage with cell fly adults, and they let them lay eggs. And then they observed if they saw uh, maggots. Um, so carrot roots, radishes, um, for the weeds, uh, they used uh, sections of, of stems, so it had some, some injury. And what they found is that the seal flies laid eggs in um, all uh, those plant tissues. And the only two um, plants where they did not have development uh, was in carrot and actually in potato. So all those plants, they do have, a deal, uh, they do have the potential to produce um, seal flies. So, um, adjacent um, habitats, uh, well, habitats that are adjacent to, to sweet corn, they most definitely should play a role in uh, corn seal fly uh, pest pressure. So we recently initiated a study uh, with my PhD student, uh, Baldwin or Core, uh, try to start understanding the role of those adjacent habitats. Uh, but for that, we need good sampling tool. And um, we've been using those multi uh traps and uh, baited with um, ammonium acetate and one for dimethoxybenzene. And um, this is a relatively um, effective and convenient way to have continuous sampling uh, of, of the flies. We could also potentially use yellow sticky cats, uh, but we've not done that. Um, actually, they attract Ketopsis massilla to a greater extent, and they don't have lures. But in case you're interested in sampling uh, seal flies, uh, the yellow sticky cats can be all messy, uh, but they also provide some information. Uh, we can talk more about that uh, not time. So what we did uh, for um, to determine uh, populations, at least of adults in different habitats. Um, this past fall and this current winter, uh, we've been conducting some sampling in, in the EAA. And each season, uh, we had uh, eight sites. And at each site, we had a commercial sweet corn field, a sugarcane field, and a weedy, booty, uh, weedy wood, well, that's difficult to say, weedy or woody non-crop uh, habitat. 
um, and all of those were within um, within about half a mile. And in each habitat, we put five traps uh, that were 200 feet apart, and they were sampled for two to four weeks. We've been also conducting some sampling in homestead, um, but um, it's relatively recent, so we do not have uh, the data at this time. For example, here you can see uh, some of the sites uh, that we have all with the help of, of growers and, and, and crop consultants. So you see, we, we cover some of the ground. This is for the, the fall and, and the winter uh, sampling sites. So this is um, what we found. Where are the flies? Um, reporting for the fall and for the winter in the EAA. Uh, here it's the eight sites, number of flies per trap per day. And uh, the short answer is that the flies are everywhere. Um, in the fall, so if you look at this figure, here has this chart on, on the left. We had um, relatively low numbers, but the, the seal flies were generally higher in the weedy, woody habitats than in sugarcane. We had uh, an outlier, and that's at this site uh, in the weeds, where uh, one trap, just one trap, caught 25% of the flies for the whole uh, uh, sampling uh, for the fall, and we're we're not sure why, but it just shows you that there is viability. In sugarcane, the numbers were viable, but you can see that some sugarcane fields had relatively high uh, numbers um, of seal flies, and in corn, uh, well, luckily the numbers were low; uh, they were kept in check with insecticide applications. For the winter, those numbers were higher. You can see the y-axis here, and um, there was no particular pattern, even among uh, the habitats. If you look, so you have site number one, site number two, three, up to site number eight. Um, sometimes you had uh, more uh, seal flies in the weeds uh, than in sugarcane. Um, uh, sometimes it was the opposite. Uh, here we had quite a lot in calm, but a few minutes before this presentation, um, I learned that uh, because of the freeze, they had stopped to spray uh, this field. So this is why we had very high numbers. And so that also shows you that if you do not treat fossil flies and you abandon the field, the, the numbers will go up very quickly. So this recent work is providing us with some information, but we're still learning a lot. And right now, this has not produced uh, updated recommendations. Um, but it seems clear that we should avoid weedy fields and, and boulders, avoiding uh, decaying crop residue, curl piles. And also um, with the field uh, that was um, not sprayed, but was left standing, we should definitely consider prompt uh, crop residue destruction. Um, in a non-treated field, um, Greg Nusley's previous student, David Owens, showed that harvested fields for four to five weeks, they can produce seal flies, uh, the adults uh, emerging. And if you leave a field untreated for the whole season, uh, you can have a peak of as many as 700 adult seal flies emerging in a day within one square foot. So a non-managed area can produce a, a very large number of flies, which might explain also why we see uh, some of the viability um, in, the different, uh, in the different habitats. So now uh, we have what? We, we have about 20 minutes left. Um, I'll move on to um, insecticides, which has uh, more uh, short-term uh, implications uh, for cell fly management. Pyrethroids definitely remain uh, the corner store, uh, cornerstone of uh, cell fly uh, management. Um, methamyl and chlorpyrifos are also effective, but methamyl has relatively short residual activity, uh, so it's not a solution in itself. Chlorpyrifos works relatively well, but at the high rate that has relatively long PHI, so again, uh, not a true uh, replacement for pyrethroids. Uh, Spinetram, that's radiant, uh, can reduce uh, infestations, but it's extremely expensive. So maybe if you have some um, armyworm issues, this is something to to concern for uh, to to consider for uh, for ear protection. And we had one test where um, abamectin 
um, provided some suppression. We're going to look at it again uh, this spring, but this is um, something um, to, to consider. So what are our current recommendations? Well, I think you should consider the use of uh, PBO uh, with the parathyroids. Uh, PBO is a synergist that increases a cell fly susceptibility to, to parathyroids. I would not use that for a low pest pressure, but intermediate to, to high uh, infest uh, well population levels for adults. I think that's definitely something uh, that should be uh, considered. Look at the label of uh, PBO. Uh, typically what we have here in the air is, is exponent because uh, the rates do change with the parathyroid um, active ingredient and, and it's right. Um, this is something um, that uh, you have to be careful about. Also, uh, we do not have a very strong data set, but we have some data that suggests that evening applications might be slightly more effective. I know that this is uh, not always doable, uh, but again, cell flies are so tough to manage that I think that uh, everything we can do to potentially increase uh, efficacy uh, should be tried. So this is something that uh, might work a little bit better than a morning uh, applications. However, well, the, the cell flies, we still have uh, management issues, uh, even if we're aggressive with all the, the options um, that, that we have, and we're not sure why. And we wonder if we have um, parathyroid um, resistance. So we've uh, developed um, adult vial assays. Um, it's a method where we use glass vials that retreat with the parathyroid to, to coat the inside of the, the vial. We're using uh, beta um as our standard parathyroid. And it's a relatively easy um, method to, to implement. And so we've been conducting those assays to uh, determine uh, parathyroid susceptibility uh, in cell fly populations to try to, to answer this question, uh, whether we have uh, parathyroid uh, resistance. And so um, this particular project is uh, my master student project, um, Eric Schwann. Um, I believe that Eric and Bill Winder uh, are participating in the, in the meeting today. So if you have questions for them, um, they could uh, directly answer. Uh, but here you see how we do the, the vial tests. Uh, we have those uh, glass vials. We put the insecticide and then we dry the vials on a hot dog roller so that there is a homogeneous coating uh, of the insecticide. Then the flies that are in the cage, uh, we select them to have the same number of males and females using CO2 to calm them down. And then, well, we put them in the, in the vials for 24 hours and then we evaluate uh, for uh, mortality. So in 2020, we were able to uh, collect uh, seven populations uh, in the field from uh, infested ears. And so um, we would wait until we would have uh, adults uh, emerging from those ears, and then we would, uh, we would test them. So here are um, our results where uh, we're showing uh, the seven field uh, populations, but we also have one laboratory uh, population here of Euxesta eluta. It's had limited exposure to insecticides, so we consider this our susceptible standard. If you look at the names of the populations, uh, EE is for Euxesta eluta, ES is for Euxesta stigmatias. Um, all those here were collected in commercial fields. Those two populations were uh, collected in um, actually non-treated fields at the tropical REC in Homestead and the Everglades REC uh, in Berlin. Um, when you look at the results, uh, the slopes here uh, show some uh, differences in the spread of susceptibility levels uh, among the populations, but um, we'll not spend time on that. We'd like us to focus on the um, LC50s here. So um, LC50s are the, uh, the concentrations that are expected to kill 50% of the population. So it gives us an idea of the, the susceptibility uh, level. So if we look at uh, the two Euxesta eluta that we had, and we look at the LC50s, uh, the Euxesta eluta from Homestead was uh, about 10 times less susceptible uh, than the lab uh, colony. 
If we look at all the other Uxess astigmatias and their LC50s, you see the LC50s were higher, meaning that they were generally less susceptible than Uxess diluta. And also, in general, those Uxess astigmatias from the commercial fields, which you can see here, you had those four populations. They were, uh, if I look at my notes here, 1.9 to 8.5 times less susceptible than uh, the Uxess astigmatias from the non-treated fields at the, um, the RECs. So what does that all mean? Well, the, this vial test showed that uh, Uxess astigmatias populations were overall less susceptible to beta sulfurethrin than the Uxess diluta populations, which confirms uh, previous observations, but here we had uh, more, uh, more evidence. And um, also, we had decreased uh, insecticide susceptibility um, in uh, commercial fields uh, for both um, Uxess diluta and Uxess astigmatias. So, we do have uh, some levels of pyrethroid uh, resistance in, um, in commercial fields um, due to the selection pressure applied by uh, the pyrethroid sprays, uh, sprays, but it does not explain um, everything we're, we're seeing. And I'm saying that because um, among the populations uh, that we had, uh, some populations were collected from fields where the flies really could not be controlled whereas other collections came from fields where uh, actually the flies were manageable and we collected them in areas where we had a uh, poor coverage. And that suggests that some of the differences in, in control were not associated with pyrethroid susceptibility. Um, so resistance or any kind of sort of resistance would not play a role there. And so I think that high localized populations um, can explain some of the management issues um, that we have. Also, uh, there is the simple fact that um, a fly, an adult, ready to lay eggs, can still get in a field, lay an egg there before being killed by an insecticide. And there's just a narrow window of opportunity for uh, effective insect treatment. And so seal flies are simply put tough to, to manage especially uh, with insecticides that have very low residual or target only the, the, uh, the adults. So we need alternatives to uh, pyrethroids. I have about 10 minutes left. Okay, uh, that'll work. Um, so a second part of Eric's project, this is where it gets really fun. We, we evaluated um, several pyrethroids, but also potential alternatives. It's only in the lab, but you see we had all those, um, those insecticides, six pyrethroids and all these others here, including some uh, that were not labeled, but we had also neonicotinoids, um, uh, the two diamides and some uh, insect growth regulators uh, that you see here. So the first thing that Eric looked at was the effect of topical exposure. And so we worked with Euxesta eluta because this is the, um, the species that we do have um, in the lab, it's easy to rear. And so for topical exposure, we use the spray booth with the uh, high insecticide rates, spray groups of flies and then put them in those uh, plastic cups and observe them uh, for mortality uh, after uh, 24 hours. And so this repeated multiple times for a total of close to, to 100 flies. And so here are the results here. So this is the same table uh, but you can look at percent mortality. Um, the mortality in the, the non-treated was negligible. And um, you can see that um, the pyrethroids killed um, 86 percent um, or more um, of the seal flies, whereas um, the radiant here uh, killed uh, 50 percent. But everything else we threw at the flies um, did not kill more than uh, 13 percent. So the other thing that we looked at was then the effects of insecticides, but when they were ingested. So the setup had to be different, cannot be done in a spray booth. So we used those vials with those micro pipettes that include, uh, that have the insecticide in honey water and um, it allows the flies to, uh, to feed. And so uh, then we can evaluate what the effect of the insecticide is. And so for this, we used, uh, one to two percent dilution of the insecticides relative to a high field rate uh, to give you an idea. 
And so this is what we found. Uh, if you look at the parathroids, you can see that by ingestion, uh, you have relatively low uh, mortality. So they are not good stomach poisons, but you can see here that the radian had um, outstanding um, efficacy. What was interesting as well is that three of the neonicotinoids, uh, the Actara, Venom, and Belay, uh, had more than a 69% um, mortality. And also the Exurel, which is not registered, uh, but it had 38% um, uh, mortality. So these um, experiments, uh, of course, they were, con uh, they were conducted on Duxesta Luta in the lab. So we know this is a susceptible population. We would need to, to look a little bit at some field populations, especially with Duxesta stigmatis. But we showed that efficacy is somewhat viable among uh, the parathroids for both a topical ingestion. So not all parathroids are, are created um, equal, uh, but Really, the most um, interesting facts were that uh, spinetram, the radiant, had some topical activity, although it was not very high, so I think it should still be on the list. Uh, but also, uh, spinetram, thymethoxam, clothanidine, and dinotephron had um, relatively high levels of mortality associated with uh, ingestion. And so this would be somewhat longer term, but I think that the use of those insecticides in combinations with baits, forcing the flies to ingest them uh, should be further studied. And that might be a way to uh, add more uh, modes of action and try to reduce um, reliance on uh, the parathroids. Before I finish, uh, we um, should have a little bit of time. I will have one uh, more poll question, but it's just more about how you perceived uh, the, um, the, uh, the presentation. I wanted to thank the graduate students because it's uh, a lot of what I presented, it's, it's their work and uh, it's not easy to work with seal flies. So Eric and Balwinder, um, Donna and, and Amir for their help, but also all the surveys uh, the help from all the consultants, uh, Matt and Michael with Good Scrub Care, Jason, I request Kevin, and um, Short with um, ICM, and also Daxiel helped some. And we also uh, work directly with uh, US Sugar and Wedgeworth Farms. Um, before I finish, um, the last uh, survey, um, as I said, is more um, about uh, how you perceived uh, those uh, those presentations. So it's two questions. And um, I was wondering if um, at least the, the presentations today uh, were useful to you. So if you you learned something about cell fly uh, biology, and you can be honest, that's okay. And uh, also if uh, the presentations were useful about increasing uh, knowledge of insecticides. Um, I will uh, give you a few seconds to answer. I will uh, share the results um, of the poll. And then if we have uh, any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Or uh, otherwise, actually, here is my contact information uh, here. So we have 10 people that have um, answered the poll. Um, 11. Okay, I will stop the poll. Right. Oh, still have one more person. All right. Well, thank you for participating in uh, in the poll. I'm going to share. And so thank you. Appreciate it. It looks like um, at least the presentation uh, helped to some extent increase some knowledge of important aspects of uh, sweet corn, um, insect pest management. So um, thank you uh, very much. We actually have, well, three minutes for uh, questions or just to take a break after that much uh, self fly talk. So I stop sharing and um, it's yours, Craig, thanks. Thanks, Julian. Um, does anyone have any questions for any of our presenters? You can go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask it or type it into the chat if you want. All right, I guess everyone's hungry for dinner. So um, if 
you are hoping to get CCA or CEU credits. Um, I'm posting right now the post test um, in the chat. I'm also um, I already wrote an email, so I'm sending everyone who filled out the pretest um, is getting an email right now as well. So if you want to go ahead and, and take it now and get it over with, go for it, um, or it's in your email. And then um, next week I'll also post the video recording as well as um the pre and post test for for any others um <clears throat> there's again also the demographic survey only it looks like only eight people have filled it out one of the things that i was really hoping to to know is if this time seems to work for people um for those that did fill it out it seems to be a pretty even split of those who like this time those who want it later in the evening those who want it midday or first thing in the morning so um maybe we'll just keep changing it around or um at least now we'll continue to record everything and continue to post it on um, the commercial vegetable production web page um, on the Hendry County Extension website. And I'll um, send all that out uh, on Monday for you all to be able to see that. Um, and, and again, after all the meetings that we have, we'll continue to, to post them so that you can keep getting CCA or CU credits if you're not able to attend the meeting. So thanks everyone for attending. I appreciate you coming. Um, thanks for our presenters for sharing us with today. Um, hope everyone was able to, to learn something and uh, improve what they do based on it. So thank you.